18th school committee order. And first on the agenda is celebrating student learning for social studies. Mr. Sweat. In the microphone. You can pull it out and turn it on. Is it on? No technology too simple for it to be confusing to me. Good evening and welcome. My name is Steve Sweat. I'm the Social Studies Department Chair, grades 6 through 12. I'm very happy to be here with John Fitzgerald, Sarah Pastor, and some students as well to talk about assessments in social studies. In the next five to 10 minutes, you'll learn about our new document-based question program in grades 6 through 11. You'll hear about performance-based assessment which is a district-wide focus for all teachers. John Fitzgerald and his sixth grade students will talk about their experiences with the Family Artifact Museum for that. And lastly, Sarah Pastor, through the miracle of computers and videos, will uh, share with some seventh graders their project-based learning based on creating a future society 50 years after the unfortunate rise of a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Document-based questions, DBQs, are basically essay questions that have documents to accompany them. Some documents are maps, some are images, some are written sources. The idea is that historians look at documents, primary sources, to figure out the answers to important historical questions. To do that, they need to read those sources, whether they're visual or written. They need to analyze and explain them to come up with answers to important historical questions. Then they need to organize and communicate them. We have a program that we're piloting this year in which every teacher grades 6 through 11, which means every student in grades 6 through 11 will do three of these document-based questions during the course of the year. The questions are um, appropriate for grade level. They're adjusted for reading level. But students will begin developing these skills in every grade this year. That means next year, most students will have already done three. In two years, most students will have done six and nine, all the way up to uh, finishing with 15, 18 before they graduate from Situate High School. So we're very excited about this program. It's really going to help students build their skills. This is just a brief example from the ninth grade one. You can see that the question was, was the reign of terror justified? You can see this is one of the documents. Students took the sticky notes. They put different notes on different sticky notes about how they thought the documents answered those questions. Then they kind of organized them to develop an answer to the question, was the reign of terror justified. In the eighth grade, the DBQ that students started with was which idea in the Declaration of Independence was the most important. In the tenth grade, it was what caused the Salem witch trials. In the eleventh grade, it was should the United States have annexed the Philippines. So those are just a couple different examples of document-based questions students did so far this year. Thank you. The second assessment I want to talk to you about are performance-based assessments. With performance-based assessment, um, students apply and demonstrate knowledge that they've learned in a unit. They're authentic and open-ended, and they take higher order thinking and problem solving. In general, teachers develop these by creating a goal for students, a role that they're going to play, and then an audience and a product to communicate what they've learned. 
two quick examples of performance-based assessment. One is in the eighth grade, they worked on creating superheroes. You're a comic book creator. You want a new superhero that personifies, puts into life a big idea in US government. That was the eighth grade performance-based assessment. In the, in the 11th grade, the performance set task they did also had to do with the Philippines and what should the United States do with the Philippines after the French or after the uh, Spanish-American War. Different students played different roles with different ideas about how best to steer our foreign policy at that time. At this point, John Fitzgerald and a couple students will come over to the microphone and talk a little bit about their recent performance-based assessment, which had to do with Family uh, History Museum. Ms. Fitzgerald. Uh, thanks for having us here tonight. I think it's beneficial for people to see uh, authentic assessments that have been going on at Gates. Uh, kids were, wow, I thought I was on the mic. <laughs> My voice, I usually don't need a microphone. Uh, so what we did, we did a uh, PBA, and we asked kids to go home and find something in their house, which was significant, or the oldest item in their house, an important family item. And the product was to find it, take a picture of it, put a museum label on it, and then eventually the kid would categorize it. They'd work with their classmates to categorize it, try to be curators, so to speak. Um, when Steve was developing this with Matt Porter and I, he came up to us, I think it was on a Wednesday, and said, no pressure, guys. Do you think you can get this done by next week? And I said, of course I can, Steve. Whatever, whatever you need. Uh, so we did get it together, and it actually worked out really well. Um, so, with anything, you always have to look at the frameworks, the state frameworks. So, I kind of want to explain how the frameworks relate to what we did. So, we analyzed artifacts. Well, the, the state frameworks dictate that students, sixth grade students, should be able to analyze artifacts, photographs, and paintings. Uh, we did this by analyzing various historical sources whether it was a photograph, whether it was an item, whether it was something signed by Ed Williams. Um, and then we have to explain how people lived in the, in the past. So history, if you really think about it, has the word story. And what we try to convey to our students is tell the story about your artifact. So what they then did, they discovered connections of, among individuals and events by categorizing. So I actually brought two classes down here. We spread their products all over the tables, and the kids came down, and they began to categorize. They looked for similarities and differences, and they themselves did the work of a curator. Um, so what I'd like to do, rather than me up here talking, I, I want to talk to you about what the kids learned, and I want them to do it for me. So. The first uh, two students I'd like to introduce are Tommy and Katie, who I asked to come up here tonight. They're going to talk to you about what artifact they shared and then what they found interesting about seeing their classmates' artifacts. Hello, I'm, I'm Tommy Scully, and I did. Um, my artifact was a, the scorecard from Ted Williams's last game, and it was actually signed by him. Um, and it was really interesting because I actually never knew that my family had that, and it was actually one of my memories from my great grandfather who passed away. Um, it was interesting to like see how all of the different artifacts fell into place because they could be organized like in so many different ways like time topic 
like if they were similar like sport, like there are a couple of things about baseball. Um, and it was just like different people had different ideas and it was just moving it around and yeah. So as you can see, the kids were invested. We always talk about engagement. Um, in the next slide, you can see the kids are, are pretty engaged in what they're doing. And they're learning from one another. So what we'll do now is we'll have Will and Ryan, who are Mr. Victoria students, talk about how they categorized artifacts, how they started categorizing the artifacts, talk about why the process was interesting, and then in education we always talk about extensions. They actually extended this exercise by writing a paragraph about it, so they're going to speak to that. Hi, my name is Lula, and um, so we categorized the artifacts by we all voted, and so we all voted for um, each table came up with um, a group with a like group of financially. And then um, the categories that came up were sports, awards, and art. And those were the three that won. And then the fourth category that we all debated upon were toys, written documents, and antiques. And then, um, uh, hello, my name is Ryan Murray. Uh, so we came to a debate for the fourth category, which was either toys, written documents, or antiques. And so Mr. Poirier said, why don't you guys write a paragraph? So we all got into our to groups and we started writing a paragraph. And we, Will and I came up with, and a group of people were saying that toys should be there because there were about five different ones that didn't fit into the categories. And three of them, one of them was a chess piece, one was a nutcracker, and one was a baby doll. Those were all toys, and they were all still being made, so they, could, they couldn't be antiques. And then they couldn't be written documents because they didn't have any like, written, on, written on them. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. So we want to thank you for having us up. I think it, it's better for you to hear from the kids and what they learned than the teachers and what they taught. And uh, I think talking about an artifact, I feel like an artifact because <laughs> open house, Katie's mom raised her hand and said, did your mom teach in Brantry? I said, she most certainly did, I'm sorry. And she said, I had your mom as a teacher in first grade. So it's pretty remarkable that you know, this has passed itself down. The kids did a great job. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, great job to all of you. Um, the last thing uh, that, that we're gonna talk to you about is a project-based learning experience. Project-based learning is a little bit different. It's also engaging. It involves students um, applying what they learn. But a big difference is, in project-based learning, students gain their knowledge and their skills as a part of the project. The uh, performance task is at the end of a unit. This is uh, the unit itself. Students are both learning and working together to investigate and to respond to an engaging, complex challenge. Sarah Pastor and her students will talk about what the project was and how it worked might be sick of me talking about project-based learning, but I really do. 
think that it's a great way of learning. Um, I think of it as a um, philosophy instead of an A. So project-based learning is more than just one thing that you do. It can be incorporated in your teaching style, and it has a lot of different things with it. So when I make units, I think about them more as a whole than as an individual. This is a project-based learning assignment. So this one has evolved over the years. Um, it's um, started calling zombie apocalypse, um, but now it's called geographic luck. And if you go to the next slide, so basically what happens is we have students create new societies, and the zombie part gets thrown in there because they are building these societies kind of fresh, so they needed something to happen to, for them to move out of situated and move out of the New England area. So we base it off of Jared Diamond's theory of that some areas of the world, societies were luckier to survive than other parts. So we study a little bit about Jared Diamond, and students pick out of a hat where they're going to, um, where they're going to set up their new society. So they pick out of like eight regions, and this is one group, and you guys were in New Zealand, right? So they had Australia that they had to pick from. So one of the things that is um, added every year, Mrs. O'Malley and I are always looking for new challenges and new spins on things, so I've had a few um, siblings from students, and I've had some of your children as well. But this year, we had students make their societies, and then as they were going to make their Wii videos, which we'll see, we gave them a curveball, and their curveball was, um, you've made the, basically a perfect society because they're trying to make like what would be the best government in a new society, what would be the best economic system, and we kind of give them a curveball of they've either had a natural disaster or they've lost their number one resource. Resource. So each year, Mrs. O'Malley and I are looking at new ways to spice up the project a little bit. So they'll talk about their curveball in a second. Um, a unit, again, it's, um, it takes a few, a few weeks to get through. Um, when they come into seventh grade, we're trying to see where students are at. So this is a fun way to get students um, into seventh grade and also assess where their skills are and where students um, are strong and where students might need a little bit more help. Um, it is daily work, it's homework, it's individual. We do incorporate science. So science goes over natural resources, natural disasters. True, right? And then they had to take what they learned in science and apply it into my class. Um, there's writing um, and then the tech piece is we use Wii video. So if we wanted to watch a little bit of the Wii video, so we just have to plug in. I can do it if you want. I don't know. We'll see if volume works. And then we'll have our students chat. This is probably another learning experience is watching, having seventh graders, 12 and 13 year olds, watch themselves on a screen. They're like, oh my god! So. So one of the um, 
I don't know, I repeat myself a lot, so I'm gonna just say it again. So one of the things they have to do is they have to look at a current country and the um, CIA stats, the geographic stats of a current country, and then they manipulate it later on to make the, um, the country 50 years in the future. So we use green screens, we use um, we video, and the filming is done in school, and some of the filming is done outside of school. So I'll turn it over to you guys. Why don't you guys come this way? All righty. So you guys want to talk about what you liked about the project? Um, one thing we really enjoyed about our project was the Wii video. We loved um, scattering around the school and um, doing our knowledge that we had and doing it into a video as a newscast and showing what we knew about our society and what problems we had and what we had to face and adversity and what we need to change about that and fight back. What I liked about the video, or, or the project, was making the script for the video because we had to come up with ideas of how we could give information but make it entertaining, which was fun for all of us because we shared our, our ideas and compared and then uh, video recorded our end result. I think that we all really liked how creative we got to be because at the beginning of the project we got to create a topographical map with limited supplies so we had to be very creative when making that and we also got to choose what our background was for the video and what background music we got to use so there's a lot of freedom in choosing that. Awesome. Thank you very much. Awesome, thanks very much to those wonderful presenters. Um, thanks to John Mad, Sarah and Jen, principals, and then mostly thanks to uh, our special guest presenters, and uh, appreciate your patience as well. Any questions or anything? I had one, qu I had one question about um, the first um, topic you discussed about the, the three, I forget what they were called. About the document-based questions? because yes, you mentioned that each grade, it, it's grade level, um, but in also reader, um, it, 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 it's, a cust it, it, it's a custom to each reading level for the student. So, so there's one that's made uh, for sixth grade or seventh grade, eighth grade, at least within that range, and so it's generally, it's an appropriate level of, of reading and document challenge. So the, okay. the students at Gates gets one, get ones that they work with, ninth and tenth are mm -hmm. more challenging, eleventh beyond that. But um, the challenge increases with the reading level and the complexity yeah. of the questions. At the same time, the skills are the same. And the so skills and the process don't change. But when it, within each grade, do you have different levels? Um, oh, that's a wonderful you, question. Uh, is there, are there different levels of challenge within, within each grade each, level? Yes. And the answer is um, depending on how it's instructed and the way it's scaffolded, mm -hmm. there are built-in options for teachers to, um, to either support students if they need help mm -hmm. or to let them to work independently. So for example, um, some of the documents, the same document comes both with a list of questions, and if the students answer those questions, then they get to where they need to go. You can also give students a clean copy without the questions, then they will puzzle it out, mm -hmm. and, and it, um, it gives everybody the chance to participate with what they have figured out, even if they have different skills as they're working their way through the process. All right, thank you. Absolutely. Anybody else have any questions? All right, thank you so much thank for the presentation. Thanks so much. Um, next up is the student representatives. OK. So. Yes. Okay. So um, one of the big things we wanted to highlight was the incredible amount of work the Situate High School Drama Club has been doing recently. Um, for the past few weeks, they've been organizing three big events, and they have a fourth one coming up that we will talk about. So the first of these was um, what they called their spooky night. And this happened on October 25th, and several of the members, um, actually a good amount of them, participate in this. And and they prepared and wrote some of their own scripts and spooky stories that they um, presented at the Gates Black Box Theater. And this was a really fun event to attend and also a great way to fundraise for the drama club and start, start off the Halloween spirit. Um, 
They continued this Halloween spirit that weekend with um, their Lost in Tower event that they do annually. Um, so the Lost in Tower was decorated with Halloween decorations and members dressed up as different scary figures like ghosts and zombies and dolls. And they did a great job um, staying in role and throughout um, the public walking throughout the tower and going around the grounds. Um, it was a great experience for um, more practice performing for their upcoming musical, and they did a great job with that as they do every year. It was a great way to celebrate the Halloween season. Um, next, they were able to take a field trip to the John Adams House in Quincy, um, and through this, they were able to get a little bit of historical background on th their upcoming musical that they're performing, 1776. Um, at that the next day after the field trip on the property of the carriage house, they were able to perform for the surrounding public. It was open to everybody, um, a few songs to show a preview of their musical. And this was really fantastic. We can't wait to see it. They're preparing right now as we speak for it. It will be this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, uh, 7 p.m. for the first two days in a matinee on Sunday. And we hope you're all able to come. They've been putting a lot of hard work in this season. And I think it's going to pay off a lot. Uh, the second thing we wanted to highlight was uh, several SHS students um, helping with the visit from our education ambassadors this week. Uh, yesterday, on November 17th, there was a welcoming party here at the high school for them. And um, several students from National Honor Society and student ambassadors from every grade were able to provide information about the clubs and activities we have here at the high school, as well as just giving um, tours around the school and helping the, them orient themselves at Citroet High School. And throughout this week, there are students who have been selected to participate in interviews, tours, and just directing the ambassadors to anywhere they need to go or answering any information, any questions they might have about what we do here at Citroet. And we can't wait to show off our great achievements that we have here. Um, the third thing we wanted to talk about was the uh, select choir and chorale took a field trip recently on November 14th to perform at the senior luncheon. Um, so I wasn't able to attend this, but I heard from the members that it was a great experience. Um, the, those attending the senior luncheon had a great time hearing them perform. Um, a, a good number of their pieces that they have been working on really hard throughout rehearsals. And it's a great trip that they look forward to every year. All right, so fall sports are coming to an end with the boys soccer playing in their semifinals game on November 13th and many of the fall, store, fall sports <laughs> um, having their senior nights and last games such as volleyball so and soccer. SHS is wrapping up the season and preparing to excel in winter sports such as hockey and basketball. Um, the Model UN trip happened this weekend. Uh, the Model UN went to compete in Montreal. Um, I do not know how that went. I, I think it went well. It probably went well if they went to Montreal. So they did great. <laughs> Uh, so Fathom also hosted their first poetry slam, sorry, second poetry slam of the year, right? Second? I meant Fathom, I should know this. Second poetry slam of the year. Um, and fa the poetry slams are really crucial for fundraising for Fathom, and we had a great turnout, and it was super fun. 10 out of 10 recommend, awesome. Um, we had the Arts and Crafts Fair on Saturday the 2nd, which supported the clubs and featured community artwork. Super amazing. I'm so glad we have that. And now Situate has a music honor society. So Duncan McCona McConaughey has started the Tri-M Music Honor Society, where Situate high school students have the opportunities to feature select groups and ensembles and share their passions of music through lessons and performances. Yeah, that's what's going on. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Right. Any other questions? No. <laughs> thank you, guys. Good job, as always. Right. Uh, next up on the agenda is the acceptance of the minutes. Thank you. We just had um, yeah, one minute. Oh, sorry. <coughs> I will get to find where I was. Where was it? Sorry. There's one part of the minute. 
It's just one part of the minutes that didn't include my entire comment. I don't even know what I said, but it just <laughs> stopped. No I'm just trying to find out where it is. Uh, I saw it early when I was looking at it. Uh. Sorry, I'll find it. Any other comments? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just waiting for you. Uh, I, sorry, I didn't mark it. It's okay. There wasn't anything major. Well, you can postpone them and you can take a look at it offline and bring it back. You want to postpone? Yeah, please, yes. Okay. All right, we'll postpone it for now. Do I hear a motion? Move to postpone the approval of the October 21st, 2019 minutes. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm aware of one. All right. I'm looking to make it All right. Uh, next up is the leadership report. I know we've had a number of presentations already, so I, I will be brief. Um, it's been a little while since we've had a meeting, so just a couple of quick highlights from uh, the past month or so in situ of public schools. Uh, first, last month, kudos to uh, the SPS Food Services team, uh, partnership with Mulaney's and Holly Hill Farm to do a farm to tray lunch experience for students. Uh, this time around, they did a baked haddock and uh, just chatting with some of our, our staff over at the Cushing School um, the other day. We had a number of kids who had never had fish for the first time, so this was their, their first opportunity to have it, and that was a a learning experience for them and an opportunity to do farm to table here in the situate schools. Uh, also, obviously, in remembrance of Veterans Day, we had a number of different Veterans Day events and activities going on throughout the district. Again, my visit over to Cushing happens to be highlighted there where they did their veterans luncheon. We've got Thanksgiving fast approaching, and uh, we do our annual turkey trot with um, great effort by our entire PE team and program. Of course, as I'm sure you know, we've got the fields project going on right now, and so we had to have our annual turkey trot over at Flannery Field, just outside of the Hadley Elementary School. Uh, again, kudos to our entire PE uh, staff for bringing that together, and you can see our fourth and fifth grade winners for both uh, girls and boys listed there from each of our schools. A picture at the at the starting line. Uh, lastly, this is one that I wanted to bring to the committee's attention, and you've got the link there below. I won't, uh, you know, put it on for you right now, but I would encourage you to take a look at it. It's a TED talk that was actually given by one of our 2019 graduates. Uh, Sam's a visually impaired uh, student, but it, he mentions even in his TED talk that, uh, you know, he doesn't consider this impairment as something that hinders him. He finds ways to continue to pursue his passions. Music happens to be the one in particular that he's really passionate about, and that he highlights in the TED talk as well. Just if you have a couple of minutes to check it out, it's, um, it's inspiring and I think it's one of the things that just helps us remember what we're all here to, to do for, for students. No major updates from DESE, um, some things I expect to be coming in the next couple of months, and a minor legislative update, as I'm sure you, you may or may not have seen. Uh, the House voted uh, pretty substantially to ban the sale of flavored tobacco products. We just had a presentation by FACTS the other day with this committee, so I thought that was an important update for you, and we'll, we'll certainly keep an eye on what, the, uh, what Beacon Hill does in general with that vote, and, and I imagine future votes on um, e-cigarettes and, and electronic uh, you know, jewel and those sorts of things in the future. Uh, this is on the heels of the governor's emergency ban, which has had some resistance in the courts as well, so so uh, obviously with you know, so much of that focus of the conversation around adolescence and the way that impacts students, that's something that we'll continue to keep an eye on. That's your brief update. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Griffin? No? Okay, next up is a presentation by the Veterans Advisory Council, Mr. Kelly and Ms. Stewart. Please. Sure. I'm the uh, chairman of the Situate Veterans Advisory Council. I'm here tonight with Joe Kelly, who's going to talk to you a little bit about something that we would like to bring to the um, in football field. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, it's called the Chair of Honor, and uh, the purpose of that is uh, basically to mirror the purpose of 
why we have the Veterans Advisory Council to begin with here in Central. Uh, we are able to support veterans in town and their families. What I mean by support, give them uh, information, valuable information uh, that's available to them through the VA and through the state itself. Uh, we also are able to assist our veterans uh, officer, uh, Don Knapp, uh, in his duties. Uh, and again, uh, the Veterans Advisory Council had a slight hiatus a little bit ago, and we just started it back up again, and uh, we want to step off on the right foot. So we want to take advantage of the new stadium by putting this chair of honor at the new stadium. Uh, I, I think it's the least that Citu can do to honor its veterans and to basically stand up for its veterans, for they all stood up for us over the years. So uh, why are we here? I, I found out from uh, Mike Hayes that I was under the impression that the school committee was in charge of the stadium. I was told nicely by Mike that the school uses the stadium, but that's up to the town uh, to do anything else with, the, with that stadium. So what we need from you guys is uh, a letter of recommendation, our acceptance that we put this chair of honor uh, in the stadium. Uh, I understand the stadium has bench seatings, and the benches are divided with aisles. So my suggestion would be to put this chair, similar to where it is in Gillette, by the way, Gillette Stadium has one, uh, at the very top, because you're not going to use that top aisle to go around, OK? You can put that chair right there at the very top of the stadium. I think it's the most appropriate place to have it in the stadium. And again, uh, coming up soon is the, the Reeds Across America here in Situate. It's been established in Situate. Nine, this is going to be the ninth year. And uh, the reason why I'm bringing that up is part of the Reeds Across America is not only to honor, but also to educate. That's what the Reeds Across America is all about. So Situate has been a part of that for the last nine years. So if you could encourage students, I know the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts come every year, uh, but if you can kind of encourage your students to maybe come down and see what's going on at Cudworth or at the uh, Lawson Field uh, on December 14th, that would be great. I'm going to leave you uh, with some information about the uh, Chair of Honor. Matter of fact, the Chair of Honor is actually donated. It's for free. Uh, and you can pay for it if you want, but uh, the reason why it's for free is we need to give them some PR. So we'll take care of that. The Veterans Advisory Council will take care of the PR. It will be a nice send-off for that chair, or a sit-down for that chair. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you guys letting us on your agenda. Uh, well, I have a couple of questions just so I can understand more. Um, have Have you talked to the you know um, Mark Novak that who's in charge of the fields project about how it could fit into the stands? Because uh, not knowing how they put it in, or I mean, would there we be any issues? We haven't gotten that far. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have a meeting actually tomorrow with the town administration. Okay. So we we weren't really sure which order to go in here, so yeah. um, since we thought you were in charge of the <laughs> we figured we'd start with you. Now we've learned that you're not, but I still think it's important to have your buy-in. Yeah. Um, and I will speak with the town. I've already spoken to him unofficially, and he's all on board with us. Yeah. But we need to also get buy-in from the um, board of select. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll be town administrator, board of select, and then once we get that go-ahead, I think that would be yeah. appropriate next step. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I, for one, am, think it's a great idea. Um, and we do, we do, we will be voting on it right now. So unless anybody else have any, has any other questions. Well, is it, is it, um, is it like a portable seat or is it a no. fixed seat? It's a fixed, the one that we've chosen, which is the better, um, mm -hmm. is, it will be a fixed seat okay. with uh, stanchions and roping around it. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, so just need, obviously the, the town is the right place to go and they'll just have to make sure that it yeah. doesn't block a, an aisle or whatnot. So yeah, yeah. I'm in full support of yeah. it. Yeah. And if for some reason that is the case and it wouldn't fit into that, we can, we can place it somewhere. I'm, I'm sure they could if figure something. Not, yeah. the field itself, it's been mm -hmm. inside, um, and like the basketball court. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case and for some reason, I know but that's not our first choice, but if for some reason it won't fit in, I'm, I'm sure they'll figure something out. <laughs> I have a feeling it will. Yeah. It would be a nice touch to the stadium. Yes. Yes. Uh, there's plenty of other towns you can live that have, have already done this. Mm -hmm. And it's worked out nicely and what's left in it. We have an end to it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Do I hear a motion? Uh, I move that the school committee write a le letter of support regarding the uh, veteran stadium chair for the new athletic complex and send that to the Board of Selectmen for their review. Okay. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. And yeah, here you go. I'll leave you. Okay. And Mr. Griffin will take care of information. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's Thank the you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next up is the first opportunity for comments, statements, questions for the public. And I've just been asked to, if you are coming up to say something, to just use the microphone so we can, um, our secretary uh, recorder can get all the information. Anybody? <laughs> no? no? Okay. Oh, sure. Just state your name and address. Cheryl uh, Idel. So I've spoken to a few of you um, about some of the processes that have been uh, that have been going on in terms of the superintendent's evaluation and the upcoming contract negotiation. I still have a few questions. I was hoping you would uh, provide me with some additional information. Um, well, I don't really feel like the, this form is the correct form to answer any questions about anybody's contract. Um, this isn't about the contract necessarily as much as it is about the process by which um, a contract is negotiated. Um. What I'd like to know specifically <laughs> is what is the process for uh, renegotiating a contract with the superintendent? So there is an evaluation, correct? Mm -hmm. And after the evaluation, what are the other steps in the process? Well, the evaluation and contract are separate from each other. But the evaluation so. can be as part of the contract negotiation. It right? could be. Okay. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me what are the other steps in the process? Well, uh, it it's just entering negotiation. I mean, it's I, I do. I, uh, It, it's in any contract negotiation, you have to indicate whether or not you're going to enter contract negotiations, and then you go from there. And it's just, as any negotiation would go, it's kind of a back and forth. Okay. So, what tools do you use um, in order to make sure you're making progress? Um, in the, I, I guess the question that I have is, um, I, I've heard that there's been uh, feedback that's been sought, but I'm still really confused where that that process falls in, in the contract negotiation process. Is that something that was supposed to be done during the evaluation process, or is that something that's, uh, that's being sought for the contract negotiation? No, I mean, we, any, any, we're, we, we, our emails are available to the public, and any comments or questions, anybody can ask us at any time. Um, so all of the email that's sent to you is public? Any email in Citra Public Schools is public. Is public, so, okay. So that's one thing. Um, the, the reason that I, I would like to know is because I've been reading through, oh my gosh, and I'm really sorry you guys, like I can't believe how much stuff you have to read and go through in order to do your jobs appropriately. And I know that we <laughs> as the public aren't necessarily always attentive to uh, the processes you have to implement. And I'm trying to figure out the difference between the evaluation process and the process mm -hmm. going forward in contract negotiations. And one of the things that's come up in all of all of these documents that I've looked through is the recruitment of evaluation comments from the public, from the staff, and from the students. And what I want to know is if that has done, if that was done during the evaluation process, 
and whether or not that was done also in terms for the contract negotiation that's coming up? No, we didn't, had not solicited any information for either. Is that something that has been solicited in the past? I don't believe so, no. Maybe Mike can speak. So in the, so from, each of us have kids in the different schools and there have been instances where in talking with different teachers or different members of administration or other parents, I mean, we do talk about anything that's going on in the schools. If someone comes to us, we do, you know, have that back and forth communication, either in person, through email, over the phone, whatever it may be. So, I mean, we take those um, interactions into account in anything that we do, whether it's changing a policy, doing an evaluation, um, going through either it's the superintendent's contract or any of the six labor union contracts that we have. So all of that is used in some shape or form as, as part of anything that we do with the school committee. Okay. So for me, that seems like a relatively closed process. The only people who are going to be able to provide you with public feedback are the people who know that the evaluation is coming up or that a contract negotiation is coming up. Um, and I, I looked through all of the minutes and the agendas from the past two years, all of which are available on the school website, and I found absolutely no reference to, uh, to getting uh, public feedback or uh, uh, talking to the staff and the students about their feedback in these processes. And I think with, our, with the goals that we've, we've set for our district, that this is something that needs to be considered. Um, and I'm not sure where that shows up in the process, but in speaking to some of you about this, um, I was told that you're always open for comments. Um, but in looking at some of your agendas, they're not necessarily so explicit. So if somebody did have feedback that they wanted to provide, there was no avenue for them to provide it unless they knew your email was available. So I'm wondering if going forward, if this is something that we should put into some sort of process so that everybody has an opportunity to provide feedback for the evaluation of the superintendent. That seems to be in line with all recommendations from the Massachusetts Association of uh, School Committees and the DESE standards. There seems to be an evidence gathering period where those requests are made. And I have not seen any evidence that those requests were made in a public in a public meeting for anybody to provide that feedback. Well, I can say that there is a new um, evaluation tool that is being um, tested because the current form that we use is, it's not very user friendly. And I personally have requested um, that Citra be part of the pilot program to use that tool and this to make it the, easier. The superintendent feedback rubric that Desi has a draft form currently? Um, it's the newer version. It's, it's the newer version? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, again, I'm just, I'm just wondering when you come back and make mm -hmm. sure that the public is able to provide the feedback. And I, I feel strongly that staff and students should be part of this process as well. And I don't think in our, in our current form it's happened. And I know that we've talked about um, a survey, the survey that didn't go out, and it was, there, it was mentioned several times in the minutes, mm -hmm. and I know that there were problems in terms of getting it out. But obviously there was a need to have that feedback. Otherwise, the survey wouldn't have been developed or thought about at all. And so to me, it appears that once the survey was created or not completed, then that, that process was, was broken down and there seemed to be no opportunity for the public to comment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's problematic. And I think that we need to make sure that going forward, part of the evidence that we collect in these negotiations and evaluation is open to students and families and staff member and uh, staff members, and that we are aware that that's being done and when it's going to be processed and how. And I don't think this committee has that right now, and I'm hoping that that's something we can do in the future. No, I, I plan. One of the things, you know, being new to this, uh, to the committee, you know, in the this form, we found problematic the issue that, you know, one piece of it was not enough feedback and. So it's kind of a learning process for us too. So we do, plan, I mean, and I guess we assume that since on the school website, you know, our emails are there. So if anybody wanted to get in touch with us, we, they could certainly email us. Um, but without a specific I, I know. <laughs> it's really difficult for people to understand yeah. when, the, when, when it's necessary and what mm -hmm. the time frame is. I mean, that's, I'm involved in the school district in many yeah. ways, and that was not something I was particularly mm -hmm. aware of. So I think that's a whole inner process that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's it. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you.
Any other questions or comments on the public? No? All right. uh, next up is the out of country field trip, uh, Costa Rica. trip to Costa Rica. Her core advisor could not make it today. She's out in the central part of the state through jury duty, so Charlie's behind enough to address the issue with the school community tonight. Hi, um, I'm Charlie O'Driscoll. In April, Sarah and I came to present to you our plans for the Costa Rica field trip for the second time around. Um, just wanted to give you an update on kind of our planning process thus far and the next steps that we have to take between now and February. Um, so we have our finalized student roster. Uh, we did switch tour companies as we presented to you in April. So we have a new uh, chaperone student ratio. So we actually qualified to bring a third chaperone, so uh, Virginia Lima will be joining us, which we're super excited about. Um, we have all of our hotel information confirmed. We have all of our passport information collected from students. Uh, in terms of next steps, uh, Ellen Claflin, the nurse at Situate High, has had our roster since September. So uh, in the next probably three or four weeks, Sarah and I will both um, go to Ellen to be retrained to administer medications to students. Um, we are still awaiting our flight information, but we have our travel dates confirmed. So we'll be, going, we'll be going Saturday to Saturday over February break, so students will not miss any school, and they'll have that Sunday to recuperate before coming back to class on Monday, which we're excited about that change from last year. <laughs> um, we recently had a student meeting with the entire group. Uh, students are very excited. Um, we confirmed all of our rooming arrangements. Um, so we're really looking forward to February. Uh, and finally, the Costa Rica travel advisory on the State Department's website has been updated. It is still at a level one, which is the best that you could have. Uh, so no necessary vaccinations. Basically nothing has changed since April. So. Um, do you guys have any questions about the planning process or updates? Um, so this isn't just for Spanish speaking, the Spanish classes, it's for all? No, yeah, it's for all students who are interested. So we got um, probably 27 or 28 applications and we um, took 19 students. We, our group this year is exclusively juniors and seniors. So two years ago we did take some sophomores uh, because our application list was a little bit shorter. So we're excited to have a group of older students. Um, most of them are Spanish students, but it was not a requirement um, to join the trip. So it's kind of like a cultural and science blend, interdisciplinary field trip. Does anybody have any questions? No? Okay. We didn't get invited. <laughs> Maybe next time. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, next up is the OCR consolidation resolution plan. So this is a follow-up item from about a month and a half ago. I'll give you maybe a 30-second 30 um, 30 summary. So about six years ago now, the, the district um, received a number of OCR complaints regarding accessibility to a couple of different buildings um, across our elementary schools. We've been working through those uh, concerns from OCR, Office of Civil Rights, I'm sorry, Federal Office of Civil Rights. And so what we've tried to do in an attempt to consolidate the, the complaints regarding accessibility is to bring them under one consolidated solution, one consolidated resolution plan. You saw the draft of it uh, about two months ago and been working back and forth with OCR now. Uh, now that that's finalized, what you have in front of you is the completed draft um, that we would like to move forward with um, to get approval by this committee and then ultimately by OCR as well. Three items there that you see highlighted, 5A, B, and C, are already reflected as part of our facilities and capital plan for the next few years. Um, this plan, this consolidation plan, links with our, our facilities plan by addressing some key facilities uh, accessibility items that have been identified by OCR. Uh, 
Uh, in this case, those three there are focused predominantly on the Cushing Elementary School. I want to again emphasize something that we talked about when I first shared this plan with you. Um, several of our schools are much older than some of our brand new buildings like this one here, and so they're grandfathered in in terms of their accessibility. That being said, anytime we have a student, either an existing student or a new student to our community that requires special accessibility, we either A, can make that accommodation, or B, if they're an elementary school student, have that student attend uh, our newest building, which is the Jenkins Elementary School, which is fully compliant. That said, these um, A, B, and C that you see here, restroom off the cafeteria, restroom off the nurse's office, and upper wing boys' restroom were items that were specifically cited by OCR as areas that need to have improvement for compliance. So we've addressed those as part of our facilities plan and our capital planning for FY21. We have our first capital planning meeting on Wednesday night that will present those to the capital planning advisory board. We'd like to bring these to um, the attention of the committee as well to show you the final plan. Next steps with the plan will be to get um, some input from the Commission on Disabilities. And if the committee gives me the green light today, we'll put it up on our school website as well for community input too. Um, once we have about a three week window of community input and input from the Commission on Disabilities, we would finalize that plan with OCR and move forward, hopefully as part of the FY21 facilities and capital process. Um, as you can see, there's four full pages of the document. You've seen this is the second time you've seen it. No major changes from your first reading but I'll certainly open up to any questions that you might have. So um, th do, you, do you need a vote on this tonight for us to move forward or no? What I would like is simply a vote to be able to publish it on our website and for me to be able to move forward getting input with the Commission on Disabilities. I would say that um, I'd hold off on a vote to approve it until I get that input from the community and the input on the Commission on Disabilities. If there is changes, what I can do is bring an edited document to the committee to show what changes you know, were recommended. And when it goes up on the website, there'll be um, directions for community members to comment on it? So uh, what they would do is it would just be community, community members directing their comments and questions direct to, to myself, unless you'd have it direct to somebody else, you certainly can. Uh, and we'll take any of that input. I'll sit down with the Commission on Disabilities with that input, and we'll make any final recommendations based on input. I uh, just want to clarify, um, excuse me, A, B, and C, it says uh, the funding will be appropriate as part of the fiscal year 21 budget. Is that through capital or through our operating budget? It's through the capital budget, okay. that's correct. And that's what you saw in the facilities plan that I put forward to the committee in September and October. These three items are on there in anticipation of the, we had an initial draft that I shared with you at that time as well. There's been no changes from OCR's perspective of things, and so we're gonna maintain that as part of the facilities plan. I again just wanna emphasize, we could make a pretty substantial list if we looked at you know, every building and all the accessibility needs for those buildings, which is the reason why the school district's been really um, advocating for and working hard through the MSBA process to have that SOI for the consolidation of the Cushing and the Hadley, and hopefully to build something brand new so that we can address not just these three items that OCR has identified, but just better accessibility for all kids that go to those schools that just happen to be the older of our elementary schools. Um, and th this may be a little bit off, but um, I know that Diana's presenting a little bit later about the Friends of Commission of Disabilities. This is this the Friends who's dissolving and not the actual commission, correct? That's correct. Okay. The Commission of Disabilities is a governmental body. Okay. Yeah. Other questions on the uh, OCR consolidated resolution? Anybody have any problems with this going up on the website? Okay. All right, thank you. Go ahead and post it. Uh, okay, next up uh, is new business, the MOU emergency shelter. So what you have in front of you is uh, a draft MOU with um, Situate Public Schools and uh, the Town of Situate's Emergency Management Agency, which is typically through the Situate Fire Department. Um, the emergency shelter um, 
MOU is timely because tis the season for nor'easters in the next month or so. A um, little bit of background again, just a minute or so, and then certainly ask any questions you've got. So we typically use our high school as our emergency shelter, one of, of uh, multiple emergency shelter spaces in our community. And with the building of uh, the New Gates Middle School, it opens up the opportunities to use this space as well. Uh, both spaces have pros and cons to them, and so we want to try to expand uh, the opportunities to use emergency shelters here in the schools to meet the needs of the community whenever an emergency situation occurs, when there may be flooding or seawalls or, or extended periods of time where we have you know, mass power outages and so on. So in doing some work to, uh, with our situate fire department colleagues to take a look at the documentation we already have in place, we found that we don't have an MOU that outlines uh, our emergency shelter um, practices and expectations. And so over the past few months, we've been working to develop and codify uh, a lot of our practices, as well as, again, expand the emergency shelter from the high school to include both high school here and the middle school as well. Um, I won't go through the all you know seven pages with you, but again, if you've got questions about in particular items, we can do a deep dive on any one of them. Um, what I'd be asking for this committee is your, your approval to go forward to sign on behalf of the school department with the town of Situate to codify the MOU. Uh, maybe you can pro provide some background in the process you had prior to, like without an MOU. Like I know um, the high schools used. Yeah. Um, and what would the process be? Sure, so briefly. <laughs> yeah, so briefly, so if in the event of an emergency, what will usually happen is um, Chief Murphy would reach out and say, look, we've got an emergency either uh, anticipated, which is ideal, obviously, if the weather reports are clear and evident in the next couple of days, or one that's uh, immediate, and we would open up the emergency shelter, again, at this time at the high school, but hopefully here at the middle school as well. We typically, we as the school department, typically staff part of that shelter. Uh, food services and custodial staff uh, provide a lot of the supports and services and whenever we're having our emergency meetings with the town we usually have some representation from that team having those conversations about when would the shelter be open for how long and, and staffing you know the shifts for that staffing and so on the fire department then provides any of the emergency uh, response so ems and those medical needs um, as appropriate obviously for the emergency shelter we then work together as the emergency unfolds to identify when the shelter will begin to close and or if it's um, not ready to to close, that is, we have community members who still need shelter, but that this space is no longer the appropriate space for them. Um, the fire department and the emergency management team usually work with transitioning those folks to other locations, other shelters, or, or working with you know longer or temporary housing for people. Um, that's the like 10,000 foot view of it. And then in terms of you know. Um, identifying when there is a emergency in town. Typically, um, when a state of emergency is called, there's usually a fund that is allocated in, uh, from which organizations, including the school department, would draw for reimbursement. Okay, so it's just all of that in writing. <laughs> it is, but I, I really would happy to go into any you know particular item in, in as much detail as you'd like. Uh, well, I mean, there was one part, and I'm having difficulty bringing it up, where once the it addresses once the the where the gym's being used the superintendent and then I'm, I'm sure i'm reading this wrong just kind of says okay um it's time to talk about uh, it you make the the superintendent makes the decision to um stop using it as a shelter is that no so it's a it's a joint decision as to where and when the shelter is going to be used ultimately. Um, because the care, custody, management, and control of the building is under the school committee and the school department, um, the determination of, you know, what I'm going to put, like, air quotes, allowing the building to be used would technically be under the school department. But again, we're all in this community together. We all recognize that we're a community that's by the ocean, that's impacted by mm -hmm. storms and weather and ocean all the time. So. Um, so those kinds of conversations are usually joint conversations. One of the items that you probably are thinking about here is that in the event that we have low numbers of community members that require shelter, but the weather has improved and in general power has been restored to a large majority of the town and the town has begun to operate, we then want to transition those community members to some longer term shelter so that we can then begin school you know, in session. Otherwise, you have school canceled for potentially weeks on end if we have a handful of folks who have been displaced for that long. 
Does that answer that question in terms of the yeah. determination? And that's, again, yeah. that's an ongoing conversation that we would have with um, the emergency shelter. Um, we'd have that with you know, Chief Murphy. We'd have that with the town as well. Mm -hmm. Um, we've been providing we've been providing the service for however long, right? Yeah, forever. So has, was there uh, um, has there been some issue in the past as to why we need this MOU? I'm generally in favor of having a policy. I'm I'm totally okay with. It. I just want to make sure that there's nothing that prompted us to put this into place. Yeah. So I guess your question, like, is it um, in response to some issue? The short answer is no. It's really in response. We had a conversation about how do we expand the use of emergency shelter to this space as well. And so what we would have typically done is we would have taken the old MOU and just modified it right here in the very beginning that says, um, you know, where these properties are. And we would just have added the middle school as one of those properties. But in looking, we just didn't have one at all to begin with. And so I um, contacted the lawyers and said, hey, can you get a draft for us? And we've gone back and forth, I don't know, for the past two months, tweaking the draft so that, uh, yes, it includes the middle school, but also just codifies the processes that we have right now. OK. Any other questions? No. Um, it, so I mean, it, I guess my, my one last question I have is there a reason why you are adding the middle school? Is it just because it's now attached to the high school? So there's two, um, there's two main reasons. One, obviously, it's attached, so there's some flexibility. But the second is that the space is actually conducive to some large groups of, of community members if they needed to be displaced. So um, while it's not here in the, the MOU, like the protocols would be using this space right here. It's a massive space. You could have lots of different areas for people to spread out. You could use the black box theater if you needed to have like quiet space or space for people to, do, you know, to sleep. It's connected directly to a cafeteria a source, so if you need to generate food and get it out for folks, you certainly can. Um, so this this common space is just really conducive to uh, an emergency space. And that's not to say the high school space isn't, uh, but this just has some more breakout spaces that can be used uh, more easily. Uh, that being said, it wasn't designed to be an emergency space. And so our high school currently has the hardwire um, generator attached to it. Like there's already been some infrastructure work that's been done to provide the high school with all of um, the infrastructure necessary to still operate if power is out in the community, um, if accessibility is down as well. So some work would still have to be done uh, in terms of you know adding additional um, wiring to our generator. And this may be out of my depth, Mr. Donlin, but essentially to rewire our generator to expand the middle school generator's capacity to operate more of this space than it's currently designed for, because it's designed to just maintain the space but not serve as a shelter. If we add it, then we'd want to add some of that capacity as well to add as a shelter. With that said, this MOU doesn't limit us or limit the fire department or the town in any way to do one or the other, but just to pick whichever one might be most appropriate. Um, does anybody have any reservations or? Oh. No. about voting on this? Tip? So did you just say that? So how would, I, how would it be decided if the shelter would be first opened at the high school versus here? Is there like a... That would really be that would be a call by the emergency management, and so what we we would get information from again usually chief emergency management, and um, we say you know what do you need? And they say oh actually we need the gates in this case. Okay great, let's start mobilizing staff and, and get yeah. the space ready for you. Okay. We would defer to the expertise, you know. Yeah. Need to vote on it. Uh, yes, we need to vote. Just to vote to authorize me, and again if you want to wait, we can certainly wait on it as well. Um, yeah. Make a motion. Yeah. Do you have any, anybody have any reservations? About, no. Okay. Yes. Do I hear a motion? Uh, motion to. Where are we? It's not on there. Uh, motion to authorize the superintendent to start the memorandum of understanding for emergency shelter at Gates Middle School. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, next up is the district early release date change. Hi, thank you. So we have, I have written you a memo to request a change of the March early release date from November, I'm sorry, March 19th to March 26th. The reason for this is that 
there really didn't seem to be enough time between the end of the first semester till the end of the second semester to have grades, uh, have to have been able to assess students enough or well enough. So we're requesting a week delay, which would also mean that parent-teacher conferences would be delayed by a week. So the calendar was approved with the early, early release on March 19th, and we're requesting that it be moved up a week to March 26th. And that doesn't affect the late start? No. No, they just switched that. Right. Okay. But thank you for that question. <laughs> Anybody have any questions for Jen? Uh, when, did, when did this issue come about? Um, shortly after we got back to school and realized, actually it was in the summer before school started, that we, we realized it probably wasn't enough time. Okay. No, I just I want to be aware of it for next year when we have to approve the calendar as well. Good point. <laughs> okay. Do I hear a motion? Sorry, I just have one more question before. Oh, we hear. sure. Go um, so I'm guessing there's no impact to, to any of our labor groups because we own the co uh, own the calendar, correct? Yeah, they could certainly impact Barton if there's any. Date, there wouldn't be a change in the amount of time, it would just be a swap of right. dates. Well, that goes to my second question. Was there any input from the staff just in terms of you know making sure that this date is appropriate from their perspective as well? Yes, and they agreed. The elementary staff is mostly, they would like, they requested it okay. along with the principals. Okay. Making sure we did dot the I's and cross the T's. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, I move to change the district early release day from March 19th, 2020 to March 26th, 2020. And as a result, update the approved 2019-2020 uh, school calendar to reflect the change. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Right. Next up is acceptance of gifts. Oh, I'm sorry. F FY21 budget calendar. Sorry. So I realize, I realize it's only November, um, but we're already in the process of, of starting to kick off the fiscal year 21 planning. And um, the first step in our process is to identify the calendar. And uh, my request to the committee would be to approve that calendar. So what I have in front of you today is uh, just a brief summary of the calendar itself and a little bit about the underlying processes and philosophy. Um, budget development philosophy is right from our policy as it stands currently, right? The first priority, obviously, for our budget is the educational welfare of our students. Um, we recognize that we also have to balance, you know, the interests of the taxpayer as well. Um, our budget process was outlined here a little bit in your in your your summary here um, that I'll go through in just a moment. But I want to emphasize that it'll end with a little bit of. Um, uh, like a preview of some of the main items that we'll be looking at as well as some of the district goals and objectives for FY21. We just had our, our meeting with our, our full leadership team uh, last week, this week, last week, and talked a little bit about the zero-based budgeting process. So a little bit about a zero-based budgeting process. It's designed so that um, it empowers staff, it empowers uh, the entire team to identify their needs across the curriculum, so pre-K to 12, and, and to do so without simply rolling over the budget from one year to the next year. So here's the example I give. If you've got a line item that's got $5,000 in it, and each year you find that, you know what, gosh, I really need 7,000, but I just always get 5,000. Well, the zero-based budget uh, approach is designed to say, let's talk about what that 7,000 is, and if you need seven, ask for seven. <laughs> And the inverse is true. If every year you've got your $5,000 line in, but you only spend 3000 well, then ask for three. The purpose of a zero-based budget is to get input around the things that we need to operate our schools and support our educational program uh, and do it in a way that's reflective of those needs and, and not just rolling over budget year after year. 
So here's a little bit about the calendar and the process. We've actually already had initial financial forecast meeting really early in the year. Uh, September 26th it just gives us a, a structure for what we're looking at going forward. We'll have some in December and January. We'll get a much more accurate reflection and projection of the revenue uh, coming in. Um, we're here on the 18th where the committee will review and approve the budget process and the calendar itself. So if approved today on the 19th, all of our leaders will receive access to their budgets through our software system. They see their actuals from past years, their budget, their year to date for this current fiscal year as well. Over the next month, uh, program leaders and building leaders will solicit input from staff to develop their, their budgets through this period. Um, one of the things that, again, is important about a zero-based budget is to ask that question, what is it that we need? And to justify all of our, our costs and our spending um, to focus it on kids and teaching and learning. At December 19th, that'll be the deadline for that um, operational input to the budget. And within that, we have a, a sub-deadline, which is December 10th, for major budget proposals. So there's really two parts to our budget. The first is the operational, the day-to-day -day operations, uh, and the second is the, are these proposals. Uh, major budget proposals are significant new spending. They're usually additional staff members, um, FTEs across any of our you know, six labor groups, um, additional leadership, additional um, curriculum materials and supplies. They could be new programs. And so, um, again, with input from, from staff, leaders would put proposals together due on December 10th for any and all of these. We then take a look at all of those, try to build consensus around what those top priorities are um, to meet our district goals and, and balance an overall budget that is both operationally supportive as well as identifying those needs that help make us grow. The 19th, um, all of that information gets submitted through our software system. Um, one tweak that we're adding to our budget this year, that our budget process this year that we think is going to help create more continuity is that our principals will obviously continue to submit all of their school specific lines and, and needs, but we really want to empower our department chairs and our curriculum coordinators uh, to submit their program and curricular specific line items across buildings. This is particularly important at our elementary school programs. Uh, so again, empowering our literacy curriculum coordinator and our STEM curriculum coordinator to be able to coordinate within the four buildings, but then make a determination as to what curriculum materials all four buildings need and what um, supplies and materials all four uh, buildings are going to be requesting for FY21. We take all that information over the December break, and um, Ms. Dahl and I usually try to consolidate that and essentially build two budgets for you. The first is the recommended budget that reflects all those major priorities and, and recommendations that we have, and um, as well as the operating. Uh, and then we have a level services budget, which doesn't include any of those you know, proposals and recommendations, but ultimately just reflects operating our schools at level services. It's important to note there's a difference between level services and level funding. Uh, level services doesn't mean the same amount of cost, it means usually an increase in cost to maintain the same level of services so that you take into account COLAs and you take into account step and lane costs with all the staffing, which is about 83% or so of our budget. Uh, January 6th, we'll do the first preview with the school committee. We'll do all of the initial budget proposals with the committee. You'll see uh, those major proposals as well and get your input around those proposals. Uh, on the 9th, we'll take a look at the operating budget plus all those proposals together as a team and reprioritize. Now, one of the things you do with zero-based budget is you're essentially asking for everybody's wish list. And typically, not always, but typically that wish list can, can be more expensive than the resources that you have. And so we try to, uh, right around January, once we've got the, the funding funding proposals, funding estimates on the from towns and, and the state and federal end of things, we try to match up what our ask is compared to what the resource is, and if necessary, go back and reprioritize until we've got um, a request that fits within the resources that we have. So from January 9th to January 27th, there's usually some pre-prioritization, and on January 27th, we plan to present the full operating budget, including any of those major proposals, to the school committee. 
February 1st is our public uh, Saturday working session. It's usually the, the weekend of the Super Bowl. Uh, again, we bring in all of our, our leadership team, the committee, community members. It's even posted in um, the local newspaper that date to have a conversation about the budget, talk about educational needs. Uh, this will be the, th at that point, it'll have been the third time that we'll have really gone through that budget, both the operating budget and um, those recommended proposals as well. On February 4th, I'll present the school department budget to the Board of Selectmen with any of that input that we had from the first, and then we'll do that again on the 6th um, to the advisory committee. Again, um, school committee, Board of Selectmen, advisory committee offer input and uh, recommendations as well. March 11th, the school committee votes the, the formal budget, and um, if that's approved by school committee on the 13th, it goes to annual town meeting, and July 1st is the first day of the new fiscal year. So I know it's a long ways away, and there's lots of steps in there, but that just outlines the general process and the key dates in our budget development cycle. Uh, some initial projections and cost considerations just to start putting on the radar. I think one of the most important projections going into FY21 is actually the state projection through Chapter 70. Uh, almost every month or so, I've been giving you an update on the work that Beacon Hill has been doing to update the Chapter 70 funding formula. Uh, again, Chapter 70 is the portion of Mass General Law that outlines how uh, state funds um, are attributed to uh, communities around the Commonwealth. There's currently a bill going through Beacon Hill right now that does a pretty major update to Chapter 70. We don't have the final version of that yet, but that's something we'll be keeping a very close eye on, and we're hopeful that once the governor releases his um, projections, that will be in line with what that bill um, will hopefully land on, and we should see some potential increases uh, to Chapter 70. Federal, again, there's been some pretty substantial reorganization at the federal education department, but our projections for all of the entitlement grants, federal grants that are funneled from the federal department of education through to DESE through to us have been relatively unscathed. Uh, we'll expect some more information from DESE on that in the coming months as well. Two other areas of projections is to make you aware of. Uh, obviously, the large majority of our budget comes through the town of Situate and through um, our taxpayers here. You'll get more information and more detailed information when we get um, the probably December, maybe even January initial uh, projections from, um, from financial forecast. And then finally, finally revolving accounts and, um, and fees that are, are levied. You know, we appreciate that it's less than about 5% of our overall budget. Um, that being said, we're a public institution. We're always looking to try to find a way to minimize our dependence on charging fees to our kids, to our community, to our parents um, for all sorts of different services. Uh, considerations. Uh, we talked about enrollment projections and enrollment numbers and, and um, the number of students ratios in classes uh, back in October. We do our updated enrollment projections one more time through this process as well to identify how many sections we need to run in each grade level on each program and that'll be part of your proposed operational budget. I want to emphasize the conversation we had just a month or so ago about optimal class size, and we'll certainly keep that into our con into consideration and uh, as part of the recommendations that we have to the committee as well, and look for your input in terms of what that class size should be and the number of sections that ultimately should be generated based on that. Uh, of course, contractual obligations for all of our staffing comprises a large majority of our budget, so like I said, about 83%, 84% of an overall budget. So we include our projections for increases, uh, turnover, retirements, attrition, leaves of absence, and so on. That currently is underway, and we expect to have that again in January when you see your first budget. Oh, one other item that we, we did talk about that I want to put on your radar is um, we've been looking at reviewing the cost for substitutes as well. Been working with a few of our, our long-term substitutes in our school district to update the school department's um, substitute um, fee structure, and not just for teachers, but we have substitutes for nurses and substitutes for uh, paraprofessionals, and we have substitutes for administrative assistants. Uh, it's something that the district hasn't looked at in a while and is due to, and so as part of this year's FY21 budget development, we'll have a proposal in front of this committee for an updated structure on our substitute fee structure as well. Obviously, that'll have an impact on our line for, for substitutes. <coughs> 
few other considerations going into FY21 out of district costs. Um, certainly it was a, a large item for our budget. And an item that I want to bring on, you, on your radar as we start to think about budget is considering some kind of special education stabilization or a special education revolving account solution. We'll talk more in more detail as we really begin our budget cycle with you, but uh, essentially a, a stabilization fund uh, for special education is something that other districts already have in place. Massachusetts statute allows for. And what it would be would be a fund that um, through the budget cycle funds would go into over time. And then if we have significant unanticipated costs for uh, special education, we would be able to tap into that resource through um, the legislative process. So through special town meeting or annual town meeting to be able to use that stabilization fund just like you'd use like a capital stabilization fund as an example. Uh, we don't currently have that here in situate, but uh, it's something that every couple of years uh, schools in general run into where they have unanticipated costs and building some infrastructure to address that may help mitigate those so that we're not finding ourselves having to you know, um, revise a budget in, in the spring or, or rethink about the allocation of funds in other ways. Uh, and finally, strategic plan priorities are always our, our top focus when we think about our, our budget. I won't go through the whole thing with you, but a couple of key highlights. Um, you know, there's always changes in state standards, and we're always looking at our uh, evolving and developing curriculum. And so trying to identify what key curriculum development projects are going to be the top priority for FY21 is going to be a charge of our team. And along with that, what curriculum materials and supplies are going to be needed. Uh, again, the support for project-based learning, for co-teaching and personalized learning, uh, supporting professional development and making sure that we're investing in staff professional development. We just had our NEASC um, welcome on Sunday, and we were talking a little bit about social emotional education as a top priority uh, at our high school, and it's our top priority in our school department in general. And so thinking about um, finding ways to continue to invest in social emotional education pre-K to 12. And finally, uh, investments in you know, STEAM education, arts, athletics, world languages, they're central to making sure that our students are well-rounded. And so as we start developing our budget, making sure that we're asking those questions, how are we investing in those areas and what does that investment look like? So early, early in the process, but I wanted to give you a primer on the process, a primer on the key dates, and uh, again, any questions that you might have, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, so any, any budget talks, of course, involve um, discussing fees <laughs> that parents have to pay uh, for busing, uh, athletics, um, kindergarten, what else? Kindergarten, it's a big one. Uh, parking, ECC. Uh, as part of this, if we're going to start talking about the budget calendar, and um, I would like to know just f how much, how much that would add to the budget. You know, how much would it? add to the budget if we were to do away with busing fees or um, athletics to start. I mean, I know it's a lot, but I think it's important that we know how much it would add to our budget. Yeah. Just for, would you be looking for that information right now? I can put it up. No, 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 right no, no. Okay. No. <laughs> Unless you know how much it would. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, again, not to, to <laughs> bore with all of it. If you just give me maybe one second, I can actually pull up um, the budget. And for community members, it's all on our website as well. It's part of our budget document mm -hmm. that we generate each year. Um, I mean, I know, I know how much we, you, you could tell us how much we collect in fees, but I know that doesn't necessarily cover the cost, entire cost of what those fees go to. FDK is probably five fifty and it's probably one point two million dollars mm -hmm. full day kidding mm -hmm. All in all teachers. Yeah. And parents. Right. Busing is probably in the neighborhood of two fifty. Uh, is what we collect, two forty, two fifty. We're probably in the neighborhood of seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars all in, including athletics. We pretty much do an awful lot of our athletic mm -hmm. busing. ECC, that is a $150,000 maybe. So this is the FY21 
20 budget that you approved, um, I want to say in March, it might have been April of last year. It's on our website as well. Um, what we do in part four is we give you a full breakdown of all the funding and resources, including revolving accounts and offsets, which is what the category of these things are. Um, you're right, though, uh, Ms. Lindblom, that the fees and the amount that is collected is not the full cost of the program itself. Uh, and so that may be something else that we can tease out and share with you. Um, right now, for example, full day kindergarten fees, um, looks like we had projected about $520,000 in fees. And um, as you can see from that bullet there, it's about 1.3 or so million dollars to operate that program in general. But we can certainly give some further detail to make sure for each of these that you can get a breakdown um, about how much the program costs, not just how much the fee is. Is that 1.3, though, the total for all those categories? That's that's just full day kindergarten. So to, or to oh, operate sorry. full day okay. kindergarden, it's right, about 1.3 million dollars. Yeah. Right, so it's about half or so of the, the total cost. Mm -hmm. But so taking that feedback, you know, as we continue to, to start thinking about FY21, again, you'll see a document that's very similar to this for FY21, but we'll make sure that we tease out for each of these some further information about the cost of all of those programs total. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier in in the um, new process that you're sending out the year-to-day numbers and last year's actuals versus projected. Uh, will the committee get to see that? Yeah, you have that as well as so yes. And if you want to see actuals more for last year versus our budget numbers, I guess is what I'm asking for yep. or asking to see. So this is what you currently, um, we currently do for each, and we do a breakdown by each building. So you see, you know, this was FY19, this is what we were, again, this is just a 20, so this is not for 21, just for clarity. Right, right, um, my question is. Uh, you want to see the actual here as well. Yes, so we budget like 856 the budget, admin. What the actual. We Next to mm -hmm. Okay. I would like to. Sure. Yeah, the actual. If, yeah, if we have that. Oh, yeah. Any other items like that? As we just start doing the development, now is a great time to just sort of give us that direction, and we're happy to put it together. How far back can we actually go with that um, actuals versus budget? Can we go back a couple of years? I have it to like, I don't know, 16 and Not necessarily add it to the presentation, but just have it as something that we can reference. Yeah. I mean, you obviously don't want you know five columns in that one slide, yeah. but just something that you know, we can reference. Yeah, your sixth grade move up to the middle school two years ago. So right, it won't be exact, but... Basically, if you go back two years, you'll get apples to apples to apples. Hmm. But if you go back three or four years, you're going to have Spadley with the sixth grade and, you know, Jenkins and so on. Well, maybe like also in terms of supplies, like do we budget $5,000 for a certain set of supplies, but we only spend 3000 year over year? Hmm. Like where are we over budgeting versus where are we not? Or for audit district placements, you know, what are we budgeting versus the actual, just to see trending as well as, you know, try to identify the areas where we need something more than, more than not. If we're only spending $2,000 in supplies year over year, but now we need 10, mm -hmm. you know, why, are we, why do we now need that 10? Like, right. Just getting that kind of detail behind it. Yeah. And one of the things that we do as part of the, the process in general is that anytime there's a, um, a request, that we want to have some rationale for the request as well, right? And one of the things to tell the staff is, you know, um, uh, more request, more rationale needed, right? So if you're asking for a large amount of money, we want to have greater detail there. If it's a smaller change, you need less detail, obviously. Um, so just a point of clarity for me, are you looking to get multiple columns of actuals, and if so, how far back? Or you just want to have that backup if you've got the questions, we can share it. Like, just help me get a sense of, I mean, give as much or as little as you want. I just want to be um, clear on what you need. Well, my, my initial was, I guess, just for last year, but I guess it would help. Paul, from your comments, comparing apples to apples is going to be easier. So, for me, two years would probably f would be okay. But I'm not sure what Mike would 17 want. 17 to 21. Yep. Yeah. All right. We'll do like a yeah. 17 to 21 so that we have that line of demarcation. Uh, September of 17 would be 18 fiscal 18. The first year. Yeah. The first year here. Yeah. And then maybe if something comes out of that, maybe we would ask for something further back. All that. Yeah, but no. I, just to be consistent, I think. For me, the two years back would be fine. Okay, we'll add those in there. Sure. Good. Other questions, comments, bits of information that the committee would like that we can we can add as we just start doing this process. 
Uh, so in the policy meeting we had earlier today, we talked about you know fundraising versus what we should actually try to include in the budget. Can, I'm guessing a lot of the fundraising is coming from sports, and I think it was a couple years ago we had gotten something from the AD that just showed here's the different things that we're looking to purchase year over year. So whether it's um, jerseys for a certain sport, and we know we projected out we're going to do you know girls soccer this year and boys soccer next year, something along those lines. Okay. Um, can we try to get that kind of detail as well as if we know what different boosters are um, fundraising for? Just so we can, you know, if we should be rolling some of that into the budget, that we start including that. And, you know, I use sports as the reference, but I'm sure the arts will also probably also be fundraising areas. So if we can try to make sure we budget appropriately for them as well, you know, where we can, it would, you know, save fundraising on the students. Got it. We'll do. Really good questions. Other questions, comments, items that you want to see as we start to do the development again of this document before for FY20, uh, 21, excuse me. Okay. okay, do I hear a motion? Move to approve the FY21 budget process and calendar as presented. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, next up is the acceptance of gifts. Diana Mullen. Yes, thank you. So um, around October 24th, I received a call from Mr. John Ross, who is a member of the um, Friends of Situate Commission on Disabilities. And he informed me that, unfortunately, the Friends of Situate Commission on Disabilities was about to disband and that they had an account and wanted to um, donate the funds to the Department of Special Education in Situate. Um, and so I wrote this letter to thank him for the gifts. We did receive the check waiting for your approval, um, but the gift is a total of $4,600 that is going to be utilized in our department. Um, some of that money I am going to set aside to help with the IXL Disney trip. And others, uh, most all of that money then I'm hoping to um, utilize as we continue to um, update and revamp the ECC playground. We this summer had to take away a swing set that was no longer um, a safe for the students and so we're looking this year to replace it and these funds will help go toward that um, as long as you all accept the gift um, but I'm sad to see that the Friends of Situate Commission on Disability is dissolving because each year they've given us a little bit of funds at the end of the year um, that's really been very helpful for many of our programs and, um, and the work that they did for all of the people in town as well as our own public schools and support supporting all of our students um, has been uh, greatly appreciated. Okay, do I hear a motion? Um, motion to accept the, with great appreciation the monetary donation from the Friends of the Commission on Disabilities. Is there a sec uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. All right, thank you. Uh, Next up is the second opportunity for comments or questions from the public. Just go to the mic and state your name. Hi, Laurie Wickrow, 62 in Lyman Road. I have a little list that I've made. Um, first thing is, how will you be communicating the change of early release date in March to the public? Will we be sending this out to families tomorrow or as soon as possible? so they can update their calendars. I didn't hear that mentioned. Uh, I can send it up tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, and then on the cushion, cushion Consolidated Resolution Plan, why is only the boys back here being updated and not the girls? So again, as I said at the outset, there's several things that we should be updating. Uh, uh, thanks for a number of the schools and uh, those that you see at uh, the plan were simply the ones that OCR had identified. So is the girls' room up to date? Again, all the schools that are um, older than I want to say 1976, don't quote me on the exact date, uh, are not up to date, which is why we want to do a full consolidation of those buildings and build something new entirely. 
So you could do the girls' rooms, you could do uh, different hallways, you could do um, different classrooms. Um, the buildings in general do need to be replaced with something brand new. The OCR item is um, the items that they had identified that they had asked to have immediately changed. So all of Cushing still wouldn't be up to date if the girls is gone? That's correct. And, and if you did the girls, all of the building wouldn't be up to date at that point because we need to build a new building. What is the policy for signs on school property? Can lawn signs be placed on school property, and who makes the decisions on that? Was there a specific instance uh, that you were referring to, or? Perhaps. Uh, <laughs> was it I the sign at the end about well, the I open house? Well, I we cannot put our lawn signs up to, to um, advertise the craft fair that was being sponsored by Shore at the high school. Yet, I know at Hatherley School right now, there's a lot of lawn signs advertising the fun run that is being sponsored by Hatherley School. Um, I know there's also, a, there's been an NDA open house sign that's sitting on school property at the middle school entrance. So I just want to know what the actual policy is and who makes that decision so that it's fair across the board. I think Jen can probably, you're, you're, Jen Gray talked a little bit about this as well because we just had a subcommittee meeting on all things advertising for our school district and um, four or five policies that we've got to take a look at uh, around equity and advertising in general. And we've got community members and school committee members and school leaders uh, on that group as well. So what I'm hearing from you is uh, it sounds like there's not equity in terms of lawn signs in this case and advertising maybe in general. Um, I don't have an answer for you about that particular lawn sign item yet. Yet, but I will say that our next meeting will have some policies that the committee can take a look at regarding advertising that we were literally working on, I don't know, four hours ago, three hours ago now. So is that a, I mean, I believe the property of, that the school sit on is owned by the town. Right. So is it really something that's controlled by the school? Yeah, again, the, the property itself is the town's property, um, but when it comes to advertising and ads in general for the schools, um, I don't want to quote you something that we may have uh, updated in about um, three weeks for the next school committee meeting. So is there a policy on that right now? There is. There's actually five different policies on advertising across the schools. But again, I want to acknowledge your question about this inequity. I think that's a, a valid um, issue. I don't have a solution for you right here at this meeting, but we've got a subcommittee who's been working on policy and just so happen to be working on exactly this issue, having a conversation about literally that same topic just a few minutes ago, a few hours ago in this case. So um, I know you're pressing to try to like, hey, give me a specific answer for that. I don't have a specific answer for you at this moment, but we have a subcommittee working on exactly that policy. So it will be on a future agenda item? On the next school committee, so December, 10, whatever that next school committee for December is. Perfect. Stay tuned. Okay. I did, haven't heard an update at these meetings about the, the bus accident that happened at Hatherley School a few Fridays ago. Um, I'm a neighbor of the accident, and I watched the whole thing unfold from 7.40 a.m. on. Um, it was quite a mess. Um, I was hoping to maybe hear about something that is important as that at you know an update at this school committee meeting where school committee members may ask some questions about what exactly happened there. Um, I know on the update that you sent out to the public, Ron, you said that the emergency brake was faulty. Um, you know that bus sat on a hill during that time, roll down into the street. It could have been a fatal, some type of accident that could have happened. Any person walking on that road, and walking a dog, walking children to school. Children were already in that school at that time. They go there before school. Um, it, was, it was a mess there. I mean, I, there was, teachers coming, parking in front of my house, parking across the street. Um, 
I would have liked to have heard a little, some questions from the school committee and a little update on that. Could, Paul, can you please answer, are these buses being maintained? Why do you not know that this emergency brake was faulty before this happened? They are being, they are being maintained. Uh, there, are brand, there are new buses, lease buses. Three years, three years old, we have a mechanic on duty, um, and they are being maintained, is what I can say. So that emergency brake was on, and it rolled down to the street? Don't know that. Didn't ask that question. What was the mechanic's report? Did it say it was faulty and was broken? They couldn't find if it was broken or not broken. It just didn't engage. And so engage. we're not sure if it, the issue was that it's broken or not broken or if that it didn't fully engage. But either way, we've taken it out of service and we've sent it off to get repaired. And we're not going to get receive it back until we get some certification from the company that says it's fully operational and there's not going to be any issues with it. Um, well, the bus needs work on it because it hit a telephone pole. I'm talking about the emergency brake itself. I mean, is it out of commission because of the accident and it hit a telephone pole, or is it the actual emergency brake? It's, it's everything, and we want that bus to have a full walkthrough of it, all the parts, not just the emergency brake, but like soup to nuts on it to make sure that there's nothing else that maybe has been missed on that bus before it ever goes back on our roads with kids on it. And we, we received the same update that the Hatherley parents received, and it, it, it's, it was sufficient for me. Uh, but I, I, in this discussion, I have a question about maybe are we going to check the other emergency brakes on the buses to make sure they engage? You know, that. Yeah. Can't yeah. So why are the buses being parked all around the town during the time between the middle school and high school and the elementary school route time? There's buses that park over at the VFW. This bus parks daily at the at Hatherley School in between the route time. Is there too much time between the routes? Yes, because the 15 minutes we have a the uh, middle school and the high school start together, and they have to be here by 8 o'clock, because that's when middle school starts. So they're usually here by 10 minutes of 8 at the latest and dropping off students. They don't have to be to Hatherley until 10 minutes of 9. So that's an hour, a good hour. So the routes are set at the elementary level, because there's four of them, at usually about a half an hour except for the one one we do down to Hamark um, for Cushing. So yes, there is a layover in the morning only, not in the afternoon. The afternoon is very tight to get to the elementary schools. So you tell them where to park them? No, I don't, no. They, no hopefully they're in that area where their first stop is. Yeah, I mean, I, I know I see the bus my daughter takes parked waiting for the route to start, but it's near where the route begins. Right. If that makes sense. Uh, school parking. We've talked about this before. The checks that the students at the high school write for the parking, $120. Where does that money go to? Goes to the general fund in the town. Um, we recently got information from the selectmen that said it goes to the school department, mm -hmm. and the situate and the checks are written to Situate High School. Is it definitely goes to the town? You could turn around and ask the, the uh, note taker tonight. She puts it all in there, and we send it to the town as the general fund. Okay, thank you. So I just confirm because someone gave different information, and I said Paul Donkin said it goes to the. It does. So, okay, thank you. Um, small thing earlier, the student representative talked about the craft fair that was uh, sponsored, um, but that was at the high school, and she didn't mention that it was sponsored by Shore. 
So just so you know, that was a sure event. As you know, as I said about the lawn signs, but when she talked about it, she made that for sure. And finally, um, the kindergarten grant that we've spoken of in the past. I misunderstood this grant, and I just want some clarification because I know it's been back to in the sort of news again in, in, uh, with Patrick County talking about it recently. So when, the, I believe it was about 10 years ago when we were part of this grant program. And I thought we got the money. I guess we never got any money from this grant. Is that correct? No, the, the whole, so we did. And that, and that grant money um, helped pay for the para in those full day kindergarten class, uh, ki just the FDK classes. So how much money did we get in the kindergarten grant program? Ooh. We got it for a few years, a couple of years, probably two or three years. I, I'd have to go back and look, but we got some classroom furniture out of that. We had to outfit additional classrooms because we only had, you know, because we were doing uh, morning and afternoon. Um, so we had to expand our classrooms. So we got uh, furniture and, you know, things that we needed for kindergarten. That was probably a good 10 years ago. I'd have to go back and look and see how much we got, but we did get grants. I remember Cushing got one to expand their uh, classrooms. Don't forget, we, had two, we only had like two classrooms, one for the morning, one for the afternoon. And we had 260 kids probably at the time. We only had, I, I, I would guess there was probably not as many as we have now. Do we have 11 or 12 now? So. Would someone be able to reach out to Patrick Carey, who's our state rep? Because he pulled the numbers, and he shows that Situate received zero dollars. No, I, I know that when the, the state implemented that program, it was to encourage towns to start full day kindergarten, and they provided the money for the extra teacher. Um, I know that because my daughter's half day did not have the power. We had, we had the, this was the same issue that we were having with um, the Hatherley first grades um, recently. Um, I don't, that, that, that's, he must be mistaken. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> okay. I mean, it shows that we, the state shows that Situate received zero dollars in the kindergarten grant program. Well, then we should ask Mr. Kearney to write us a big check because we, <laughs> we were paying Paris for those classes. And I know that we had to, we were not allowed to charge um, more than 50% of what a typical, um, a half-day classroom would be. So in other words, if we spent $500,000 on 12 half-day classrooms, we were only allowed to collect 50% 50, 50 of that $500,000 at first, which is, it was all kinds of different uh, machinations that we had to go through. Um, but I know we got some, I know we got money. And Cindy's shaking her head back there. Yeah. Okay, so we can follow up with we'll, we'll get that information to Patrick Kearney. Thank you. I'm, Thank you. Oh, I'm next. <laughs> next up is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, Jen O'Neill, I just have a question that came out of the, the Hallowley, um situation. How will that day be made up? Will it be oh. added on to the end of the year? No. Um, Mr. Griffin applied, uh, requested that it not be made up. Uh, he put the request into Destiny and they granted that request, so correct? Yeah. They do, not have to make up well, they do not have to make up that day. Okay. Yeah. All right. Next up is the. Those families know that. I think, yeah, they went out in the email. Okay. All right. Next up is the facilities update. Mr. Donlan. Okay, uh, the fire doors that we got on the capital plan last year have been installed and wired to the alarm system. That is complete. All the classroom and office locks are done at Wampatuck. Uh, that was a project started by uh, Superintendent Griffin at the elementary schools. All classroom and office locks are done at Hadley. 
all classroom and office locks will be done next week uh, by the end of this month, uh, maybe the beginning of December at Cushing. Um, the security upgrades uh, that we got at the last capital um, meeting uh, last year at the annual town meeting are in process and to be completed by the end of December at all six schools. Uh, we're working to finalize our copier contract for the next three years. Um, we removed the sunshade assembly at Wampatuck Playground. It's, this will be sanded and painted and getting ready for uh, the spring. Wampatuck exit signs are all fixed and functioning. We do need to add one more sign um, per the uh, fire department at the ECC, and we're in the process of getting that taken care of. We uh, upgraded the emergency lighting um, on our generator at Wampatuck. Um, Cushing custodial staff has painted the bathroom doors and stalls. Uh, and we're working on replacing the dishwasher at the high school as that was, it's a very old system, very difficult to find the parts for the existing dishwasher. And that's consolidated quickly. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Donlin? No? What, uh, what, is, what is the uh, sunshade assembly at Wampatuck? The I believe the um, PTO bought a, a rather large uh, sunshade uh, that we had to take down. Is that okay? Diana knows a little bit more. <laughs> this is in the ECC playground. Okay. So um, the structure has came from high school, went to the Wampatuck, and it's it was rusted and the needs a new. Um, shade structure, but the the uh, poles and whatnot are all good. They just again needed to be sanded down and painted. Okay. Fresh uh, fresh look for it for the spring, so we can have the shade for the students playing on the playground. There you go. Right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Donlin. Okay. Next up is policy review. Uh, policies DK and DKC. Yep, so these are just second readings. Again, um, I'm trying to do an update on policies across the board just to keep our policies um, up with MASK and DESE and any regulatory changes uh, across the Commonwealth. Uh, you took a look at DC at our last meeting. I'll pull it up for you in just a moment here. Um, payment procedures for our school districts. Um, you had no many major questions at our last meeting other than, again, that we recognize that it's the Situate Public Schools and we identify Situate there. Um, open to any questions that you might have for this policy. Anybody have any questions about this policy? No? No? All right, do I hear a motion? Move to approve policy DK payment procedures as amended. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. DKC uh, reimbursements. Um, again, not a lot of major changes on this. Um, one of the items there was about the school committee members having prior approval uh, for school committee and in school committee member traveling. We don't typically get a lot of that, but if we um, had that in the future for, let's say, you know, visiting um, other elementary schools as inspiration for something in the future, um, we'd want to have language around that. Uh, again, this is your second read on it. Open any questions that you may have. Are there any questions regarding this policy? No. Okay, do I hear a motion? Uh, move to approve policy DKC expense reimbursements as presented. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Very okay. good, thank you. Uh, warrant signatures? We have in front of you a warrant that was signed by Mr. Hayes. Seventy-five thousand four hundred seventy-five dollars and seventy-six cents. Do you have any questions? Can answer? Well, Cindy can answer. I should say. Okay. Okay. 
Um, next up, correspondence. You usually have your mask pool in there. Mm -hmm. Again, a lot of the information that you uh, see on your policy updates usually comes from mask. All right. Uh, any other business? Anybody? No. All right. And we see the future agenda items. Okay. Anybody have any other questions? Nope. Nope. Okay, uh, it's this t at this time, the school committee will enter executive session. Um, do I? Yeah. Adjourn. yeah. I'm gonna adjourn, adjourn the public session and do I hear a motion to enter executive session? I adjourn the public session at 8.03. <laughs> second. Oh, do I hear a second? Second to All right. adjourn. All right. All those in favor? I'm sorry? No, he's insisting I. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, at this time, I'll accept a, a motion to enter executive session by roll call. Yeah. HS. Lindblom, yes. Thank you all for coming.